Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Grace Farms Foundation evening with Mary Evelyn Tucker. Tonight, my, my name, by the way, is Mark Fowler. I'm the Nature Initiative Director here at Grace Farms. And tonight, we are so honored to be celebrating the incredible work of Mary Evelyn Tucker. Mar Mary Evelyn, very nice to see you. Welcome. Mary Evelyn is a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale University School for the Environment. She is the leading voice in, the, in, in ecology and religion and runs the Forum for Ecology and Religion at Yale University with her husband, John Grimm. Mary Evelyn produced a film called Journey of the Universe, and it is the most beautiful and powerful film tonight. Hopefully, everybody who's joined us this evening has been able to check it out and uh, see it on Amazon, on Amazon Prime or on many different outlets you can watch it, and has been able to get up to speed on the beauty and wonder that this film brings. Mary Evelyn, I have to say that when I watched the film, it literally blows one's mind because you take us in a beautiful and simplistic way through one of the most complex and, and ancient stories in the history of the universe, literally. So I, I was actually completely blown away by um, the simplicity, but also the complexity of your storyline. And it's actually, you can actually understand and digest this beautiful story. We as humans, have been asking this question since the beginning of our species. Who are we? Where are we? You know, what is this place surrounding us? And how did we get here? And your film, in such a beautiful way, begins to answer that question. Mary Evelyn, I, I, I just am one of the largest fan, your biggest fans, so I'm so honored to be here tonight. We, um, just a, a little housekeeping, everybody, when you come on, please keep your, your, vi your video and your audio muted. We're going to show the teaser of Mary Evelyn's film. It's, it's through our Zoom. It's through the Zoom portal. So, it's, you know, sometimes that's, that technically can be a challenge audio-wise. But we're going to show the video. Then you can all go to, uh, to, to see the film online at, at Prime or Vimeo or many other links. Mary Evelyn is not only done this film, but she has also created a major online course, an MOOC, at Yale that we can all take. She has taken this incredible story, this super advanced knowledge, and actually opened it up to the world. So I'm just so excited to hear Mary Evelyn's presentation. We're going to watch the teaser, then Mary Evelyn will begin her presentation about the film and about her work with the Forum of Religion and Ecology at Yale. And then afterwards, we get to talk and we get to ask questions. And so as the audience, I, I would love it if you can share your questions in the Q&A box here on the Zoom, in the Zoom uh, portal. And then hopefully we will be able to answer your questions and we will all be inspired by the most incredible spokeswoman for the planet and for the universe, Mary Evelyn Tucker. So Mary Evelyn, we're going to go to the video and then we will welcome your, your, we can't wait to hear your presentation. You know, Pythagoras probably walked on this very beach. And if he were here today, he would be amazed at how much mathematical science has learned about the universe. Even a century ago, we didn't know if there were two galaxies in the entire universe. Now we know there are a hundred billion, maybe even a trillion galaxies. What is the creativity that brought forth a trillion galaxies? In the last couple centuries, we have learned more about the Earth than in perhaps the previous 100,000 years. How are we going to convey that, the essence of that, to the next generation?
The universe began as a great outpouring of cosmic breath, cosmic energy, that then swirled and twisted and complexified until it could burst forth into flowers and animals and fish and all of these elegant explosions of energy. These deep discoveries of science are leading to a new story of the universe. Over the course of 14 billion years, hydrogen gas transformed itself into mountains, butterflies, the music of Bach, and you and me. Thank you, Mary Evelyn Tucker. Welcome, and we I'm so excited to have you. Please take it away. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to you and all your staff at that beautiful Grace Farms. So happy to be here tonight. I'm going to share my screen. So I was saying we live within a new story. Next slide. And stories create community. Next. They light up our imagination. Next. Or they ground us in place. Next. They, we have creation stories from all the world's religions. Next. They teach us worldviews and ethics. The Hindu myth, the churning of the world's ocean is one example. Next. You can just keep going rather quickly through these. We're in between stories. We have an evolutionary understanding of the universe and earth that's expanded. We have just a second. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there at, at Darwin. So Darwin changed everything, 1859, with the origin of species, leading from Copernicus and Galileo. Next. Next. So Einstein as well needed to be convinced, next, with Hubble of the expansion of the universe. Next. So in 68, this Earthrise picture changed everything from our sense of the vastness of our beautiful planet in space. Next. So a new story came about in 78, this integrating story of evolution, universe, earth, and human, and inspiring cosmology in which we find our place and our role. Next. And that was Thomas Berry in his book, Dream of the Earth, and in the great work. Next. And in the universe story, 1992, that's where we're starting up again. Okay, let's go forward. Next. And the book from Yale in 2011, just 10 years ago, the translations we can see here, different languages. Next. Next. And it, this film that you've seen, hopefully, or you will, next. And that has been shown on PBS, Amazon internationally, and various translations. Next. And we have also conversations where I interviewed. Uh, next. I interviewed 10 scientists and historians on the evolutionary story and 10 environmentalists on action on how economics will change, cities, race, energy, food, education, the arts, and indigenous views. So the great story for the great work. Next.
Now, there were also, as Mark mentioned, these massive open online courses that are actually through Coursera, the platform of online courses. There's two on Journey, there's one on Thomas Berry, there's many participants watching, them, and it's been translated into Chinese. A great interest in China in this work, incidentally. Next. So we are in the Anthropocene, this age of human-induced planetary change. Next. So these, that is because we have great ecological and social challenges, as we know. We have climate change, eco-justice challenges, pollution and toxicity, food security, increased inequity and extreme wealth, consumerism and dreams of progress. We have biodiversity loss and extinction of species. And these are overwhelming, as we know. But next. We are in this period from the end of the Cenozoic to the Ecozoic era. 65 million years ago, since the extinction of the dinosaurs, that was the end of the Cenozoic from 65 million years ago to the present. And we are now in a sixth extinction period because of the loss of species all around us. Yet we are awakening at the same time to a new intimacy with the universe and earth community for the flourishing of life. And Thomas Berry called that the ecozoic era, something that we are birthing and birth is difficult. And places like Grace Farm help that birth. So we are in an evolutionary context of deep time, awareness of evolution and its beauty and complexity, but we're also aware of extinction and loss, both of these going together at the same time. Next. So evolution is a new story and the deep time for the emergence of life of galaxies, stars, solar system, planets, ecosystems, and life forms. All of this is inspiring awe, leading to care. Next, we'll just go through each of these very quickly. So we have galaxies and stars. Next. We have the emergence of solar systems and our own solar system within the Milky Way galaxy. We have this beautiful planet of water, air, soils. Next. And cellular life, you know, it took a billion years for the first cell to emerge on the earth and 4.6 billion years of life on, of, of evolution. A volcanic life had to come before we had a diversity of life. Next. and these amazing ecosystems that are so inspiring um, everywhere in the world, these extraordinary complex ecosystems of life. Next. Plants that came about just about 200 million years ago, along with our own evolution. Next. and non-human animals. Next. We'll go through a whole little thing of the beauty of animals, just keep going. Keep going. And humans about 200,000 years ago evolved and we have future generations now to think about. And that is the point of this story. Uh, what are we thinking about for future generations? We know we belong here. We've always belonged here. And that's what this story is telling us. Next. We are be be beginning to understand that we belong to interconnected ecosystems. You can see tree life, animal life, water life here. We're discovering all kinds of things about these living systems. We're understanding the interdependence of ecosystems, the relationality of animal behavior, 
reciprocal resonance in forests. And let me just say something about um, these. In terms of animal behavior, this has exploded since Jane Goodall uh, discovered the behaviors of chimps. We now know that the communication in all in marine life, in dolphins and whale songs, uh, in bird migrations uh, across thousands of miles on our planet, the, the immense sense of, of primates of, to whom we're related 99% um, is something that's come forth just within the last 60 years, the range of understanding of animal behavior and communication uh, that is going on within the animal world and, and therefore also within ecosystems. One particular example is forests. I'm sure you know the book, How Forests Think, uh, and, uh, or perhaps the Song of Trees. This notion that forests are communicating through their root systems, uh, through the fungi and so on, and protecting themselves even from harmful invasions and so on. So the sense of a living earth is coming forward in, from the sciences. Um, so that the whole point here is for the flourishing of the earth community. Next. Now we are between stories of hyper individualism versus holism. How are we as individuals going to find ourselves part of a larger whole? We know we're in the midst of struggles of nationalism and internationalism. And my grandfather, Carlton Hayes, his last book from Columbia, he, he wrote about nationalism as a religion. And that's what we're seeing, but we're also seeing the movement of internationalism. I go to many UN conferences and it's astounding to see. We're also between economism, where the gospel of wealth versus well-being is a struggle for humans. Um, this notion that more wealth is better or going to bring happiness is, I think, a great myth that we've seen in the last several years. The American dream uh, is not just about wealth and luxury. Um, so militarism versus nonviolence is another huge dichotomy where we are right now. Um, Racism, sexism, classism versus inclusivity. We are pushing the boundaries of coming together for inclusivity. It's a struggle. It's not going to be easy. But if we see these as creative tensions, we can move, I think, from hyper individualism to a sense of the earth community, from a sense of separation and alienation to holism. And the, the point here is there's no future without a shared future. And individualism <laughs> cannot last in things like even team sports or orchestra or musical choirs and choruses. We need the whole. We need this sense of air, <laughs> of water, of the atmosphere and ecosystems that keep us alive. And that's the movement towards holism. Next. So <clears throat> we are in a period of moving from enlightenment values just for the individual, which have brought great freedoms, democracy, and political systems of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But these have got to be expanded. Let's look at the next so slide. So they, we need interdependent values for holism. We need a sense that life includes the life of all species. We are losing bees, for example, the honeybees that pollinate so many of our crops and even taking bees around and trying to make them pollinate. I just heard last night people in China are self-pollinating these crops. How can we not value the great life species and systems around us? And that requires a liberty that has responsibility, not just individual's freedom, but responsibility for the flourishing of the earth community. And it has a sense of happiness with a sense of belonging, that the quality of life is more than the quantity of material goods. Next. <clears throat> so we are aware of our relatedness to cosmos and earth. 
We know we have a common evolutionary heritage. Our film says the stars are our ancestors, and that is a fairly recent discovery. We have a shared genetic language, as I've mentioned, with the primates, with all human beings. This is part of the fraternity with all life. It's biological, it's genetic. And this is a call for the flourishing, the care and flourishing of people and the planet. Next. So I want to just conclude here, perhaps, so we have some time for discussion with a sense of broadened values are manifesting in a variety of ways. I could give all, all kinds of examples, but I want to just take one from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, because I'm sure many of you have been there. So we have an evolutionary story and ecology already at that museum, and it's been alive in exhibitions for some decades now. So I'd like to just share that with you. In other words, the universe story, this journey of the universe is already part of our life, of our understanding of who we are. We need to evoke it, elevate it, inhabit it. So next slide. So here, at the American Museum of Natural History, we have the Hall of the Universe. And within this incredible glass structure, that ball has a pathway. I think that the other slide had, but you start at the top and you walk down that pathway. And every step is several hundred million years. So you get this sense of a great journey, that this is a 14 billion year evolutionary process. And the sense that the universe itself took 10 billion years to evolve. The earth, 4.6 billion years. Next slide. So when you get down to the bottom of this cosmic pathway to human history, there is one small <laughs> exhibit that you can just barely see to the right. And it's a picture of one human hair under glass. And it says, this is all of human history compared to this immense deep time process. So our sense of belonging to this process hopefully gives us some humility to its unfolding. Next. Now, in the Hall of Earth, uh, right next to that Hall of the Universe, we have an exhibit of plate tectonics of the living Earth. Now, here's part of how long this story has taken to come into human consciousness. Now, plate tectonics, as you know, means that if you look at South America and Africa, you can see like a great puzzle, how they would have fit together <laughs> billions of years ago. But we had, as you know, Pangaea, the, all of the continents coming together, and then they spread apart. And you have the movement of plates, uh, tectonics, which causes earthquakes uh, and eruptions. But we did not know about that until Wegener discovered it uh, in the early part of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century. And it took 60 years for scientists to accept the science of plate tectonics because they dismissed it. Um, so again, how we're part of a living, dynamic, unfolding Earth is still coming into human consciousness. Next. Now, when we did our final conferences on world religions and ecology at the Natural History Museum in 1998, after a series at Harvard for three years, we said to the provost there, uh, we said, Mike, <laughs> will you allow us to have a conference on religion, environment, <laughs> evolution, and so on? We were a little bit nervous about that, but he said within a moment, yes, you can have the whole hall uh, of the auditorium free because why? We have just discovered, this is Mike Novacek, who's still the provost at the Natural History Museum. He said, first of all, my 
grandmother used to read me Teilhard de Chardin. And so I got a feeling for this unfolding universe. But he said, then we also have um, graduate students studying here at the museum of birds. And so their studies in ornithology have revealed to us, uh, there were six finalists for a position in ornithology uh, at the museum. And of those six, four had had their birds go extinct while they were studying them in graduate school. So this was a wake up call for the museum. And they said, we cannot just be scientists standing, watching at the edge of extinction. We need to be engaged scientists. And they put up the Hall of Biodiversity. Let's look at the next slide. So this Hall of Biodiversity, I hope you have seen it. It's an explosion of the life forms that have come about in this Cenozoic period, this last 65 million years of life on our planet. Um, at the top, there's a huge octopus. I don't know if you can see it here, but and at, in this hall, one side has ways of resilience and restoration of ecosystem. The other side has the destruction. So it's part of this awe and wonder and beauty and it loss. And you walk between these things back and forth. And it's saying we can, on the floor is the plaque there that says we can stem the tide of destruction. That's an amazing statement for a science-based museum to be saying. But that is what is gonna happen in this coming year. There are UN conferences on restoration and there's a huge UN conference on biodiversity uh, and what we can do about it. I think I have one final slide here after this next. So I'm going to just end with this one on our common future. I think all of you who have children, all of us like John uh, and me who don't have children, but who consider our students to be our children. We've been teaching for 50 years now. Uh, we adore them. They have so much creativity. This report called Our Common Future led us into this new path of, of trying to figure out where we belong, what is our role, what can we contribute? And it gave rise to the Rio Conference of 92, which said between economic development and environmental protection, how can we create a balance? This is what we are struggling with right now in the midst of COVID, when we recognize we are overstepping the boundaries of ecosystems and species. And so this is a great wake up call to recalibrate this sense of overextension of humans. And that is our moment right now. But we need a story that's going to bring us together, bring us back to a sense of holism, possibility, unfolding, and the human energy that's needed to make this great transition. So thank you, and I'd love to have some questions. Wow. Thank you so much, Mary Evelyn. This, every single one of your slides is mind blowing in a way and opens up so many more questions, I think, for all of us. Um, I am, I am very inspired by the fact that you, you actually, even though you've seen all of this, and you, you educate constantly about the, the, the incredible history of the universe, but you also communicate constantly about the state of our planet. And what really has inspired me from your presentation and from the film as well, is there is a sense of hope still. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one thing that we at Grace Farm share with you, which is, you know, we hear every day that our relationship to the natural world is one of just purely a negative, negative relationship, that we are always destroying the planet, that we are always going to cause the world to end very soon. And what I find is, I think what you're what you're seeing is, you know, you're right. We have this individualistic individualism that that has led us to this point. We have, and we are. But you you mentioned right up front. But there's, did you use the term an eco scene? Was uh, was that the term? 
ecosystems maybe well but, you were saying sort of a revolution which is which takes into oh, account an anthropocene yes, yes anthropocene yep and, and so that's where humans are having this huge negative negative impact is sort right. of the concept behind anthropocene but then you mentioned there was sort of a future movement that's just oh. beginning and you said you know birth is challenging birth is hard yes and i feel like that is such a key moment what is the name of that movement you're you're yeah. envisioning well, and I think the word you were thinking about was ecozoic, from the yes. cenozoic to ecozoic, which was Thomas Berry's term. Yeah. And, you know, he tried to open up the space of hope and possibility. And I know that we are all struggling. Um, the, the issues we're facing are enormous at every side. We know that. Uh, and people, I think, are struggling with despair, with disempowerment. Young people are especially trying to figure out what is their role. And this is why we like to say this an intergenerational handshake that we're giving to the next generation, because our students at Yale, at the School of the Environment in particular, are so creative, are so filled with a sense they can do this. And at the Divinity School, they want to be ministers that will bring uh, the ethics of this and the energy of this um, to people in their parishes and so on. So we see great hope there. Well, and so I, with that message, I see I see the rest of your story, which is, you know, at, at the end of your film, you talk about, he says, wonder is what will drive us. Yes. You know, and that is to me was was a, a sort of a revolutionary part of this because what they what everyone says is that children the first time they experience wonder, the first time they experience awe is when they see and their minds are blown by looking up at the stars or seeing an animal or touching a, the, a leaf of a tree. Yeah. And so, you know, it is so innate to us to feel the awe and wonder that mother nature can provide. Yes. And, and so I agree with you. I mean, I, I see us in a, we, like you said, we are in a, an, we are in a an opportunity moment where we have just seen what we have seen the writing on the wall. We have seen what happens when we go deeper and deeper and unsustainably exploit and traffic in wildlife and and bush meat and and as a global society over consume and over consume and try to sort of dominate and have dominion over Mother Earth. We've seen what happens. We now know. I mean, I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because we we now know what it's like to lose our habitat. In the in the past, I would say for wildlife, the largest challenge is habitat loss. We now know what it's like to lose our habitat and we see what what major you know problems it causes for our society. So we have an opportunity. The largest challenges create opportunities. What are your thoughts about where we are as a society and where we can go from here? Right. Well, that's just so wonderful. And I, you're hitting the right issues. And I love your enthusiasm and passion about it. And, you know, I just I want to give a little shout out. I believe my cousin, uh, Dr. John Mahold is on this, who is a dedicated cardiologist who himself had COVID, went back to work and so on. And, you know, this is part of what gives us hope, isn't it? The dedication of people for the healing of other people but they, and he has done a TED talk on this, to say just what you've said, we've got to wake up to these types of interconnections um, that are part of our uh, awareness now. So, you know, I think this struggle, as you've said, between opportunity and, and hope is exactly where we are. And I just wanna share something I'm writing about a little bit. And that is when one's worldview breaks down, a new worldview has to emerge. And Teilhard de Chardin in World War I, as a stretcher bearer with immense destruction around him, saw evolution as moving forward. So out of this destruction, he came to, just as you're saying, wonder and awe that inspired him his whole life. And I would say in the 60s, and many of you listening might identify, I was very discouraged by the Vietnam War, by the civil rights upheavals. I went to college in Washington, DC, and my worldview began to unravel. I went to Japan and I began to put things back together. 
because it had been a disintegrating experience. And I began to see as the Japanese have, and they're not a perfect society either, but they have this tremendous sense of the livingness of things in Shinto and in Buddhism, um, for sure, and even in their shamanistic traditions and in their arts. And again, that's what Grace Farms is trying to bring us back into that space. So we've got to create these worldviews of holism. Um, the universe story is, is one, but we have to keep doing that because where we rest on meaning and purpose can be very shaky. And I think it's very shaky in this particular moment. We are really struggling. So wonder will guide us. And I wanna give a big shout out to Brian Swim because he's so filled with enthusiasm in, in this film and certainly in this whole idea for many years. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you that you speak about in the film and that you are now teaching in your massive online course i mean i'm blown away that i can take a six-week course in different parts of the messaging of this film that that blows my mind and but what what, what one of the messages is is there an ancient knowledge that we can access to how how we can move our our to a positive flourishing future flourishing is in your is very much in your presentation where instead of a doomsday prophecy, a prophecy of where humans and, and nature are flourishing together. And so one thing that I've come to learn and through you actually, I mean, I saw you at the UN and you and I were both delegates at the UN environmental program, um, nature, and I'd almost say faith in nature. That That's sort of how I'm looking at the movement is having faith in the power of nature and, and, we, and humans as part of it. But, you know, you've reached out to all the gl global faith communities to to try to to try to instill a message of stewardship, and 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 we talk. You know, we sort of jump to this idea of what can we do as people of faith, but you know, because of the the history of of you know sort of religion and even of the Abraham Abrahamic um, religions, there's this idea of dominance over nature. But you know, there's an alternative view, and I feel like your message of inclusion. Your message of inclusion and um, of of all races and all ethnicities um, and all life on Earth, there is an alternative view, and that's very much an indigenous perspective, an indigenous belief in the interconnected interconnectedness, in the sacredness of humans and our relationship to the planet as part of Mother Earth. We are part, like your your film says, we are the universe. Everything that flows in our veins is, is the dust and the gases from the universe. So my question is, how do you see this sort of, I see that we can take, we can take and we can, we can, we can actually work with indigenous communities to learn and to instead of, instead of focus on wh where we see our modern world has taken us, it oftentimes can be, a, it's a void in some ways where our modern world has taken us, a spiritual void. I see that the indigenous voices, the indigenous knowledge and this diversity of, of in native indigenous local communities and this relationship to the planet, do you see hope in that message? And can we work together as Grace Farms and Yale and, and our colleagues at the UN, can we work together to, to, to increase that awareness and really bring those voices of inclusion and 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 the sacredness of nature that many indigenous people um, see. What are yeah. your thoughts on that? Well, that's great. And I also want to just give some time for the questions in the- um, Yeah, sorry, yes. No, 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 this is so great. I love talking with you, Mark. Um, I think, thank you for that question. As you know, my husband, John Grimm is a student of, uh, a scholar of really of indigenous traditions and we are adopted into the uh, Crow family um, in Montana. So we spent a lot of time um, there on that reservation. And also he spent a lot of time with the Salish people in Washington state. So indigenous voices are obviously central to so much of this transition. And in fact, many of the oppositions to pipelines, if you will, all across North America, Canada and the US have been led by indigenous people like Standing Rock, Water is Sacred, uh, and so on. And in fact, I'm part of a interfaith rainforest initiative that was started mm -hmm. by the Norwegian government with the UN Environment Program. 
And what it's doing is the Norwegians who had given over 12 years, $4 billion to pr preservation of rainforests said, we can't do this without the voice of indigenous peoples. And so what we're trying to do in this project, which is about three years old, and we're having a new collaboration with our school of forestry at, at Yale is to say indigenous peoples are the guardians of the forest. And we need religions in that area, Catholics in Brazil and so on. And, and uh, evangelical Protestants in, the, in these regions to support indigenous voices with science, with ecology, with good journalism and communication. It's an amazing initiative, unprecedented in the 25 years that I've been doing this work in religion and ecology. So yes, yes, yes. And maybe I can just segue, Mark, because one of the yeah. questions was about Confucianism. Which yes, is, please, please do. Yeah, well, the questions are great. And so I think I'm not gonna read the question because it's, it's long, but it's very good. And, you know, Confucianism has probably influenced apart from indigenous traditions and their longevity, but more people over time than any other tradition because of the size of China, it's ancient history and so on. And continuing to today, because the Chinese with all of their problems are realizing their environmental issues are so critical that they are calling for an ecological civilization and they're calling for the revival of Confucianism and these traditions to do that. Unprecedented, because um, Confucianism was almost destroyed under Mao, uh, as, as you may know. But these ideas, they're reading their classical texts again, they're repossessing the idea that the cultivation of the human for virtues leads to it, like concentric circles, affects everything, the family, society, the nation, even nature and the cosmos itself. This is a huge um, view, you see, of how we cultivate ourselves and what it affects. And that's why education Education is so important in these Chinese influence worlds of East Asia. Um, and the leader, this to the question, a leader has got to be a moral leader. <laughs> I want the long story about Nixon <laughs> going through the Metropolitan Museum with a Chinese exhibit, and there was a mandate of heaven <laughs> that said, if the ruler is moral, he can keep the mandate to rule. <laughs> and he just kept on walking. But that's the idea that human virtues affect society, politics, uh, and so on. Um, and this person is also asking, of course, about how does this apply to Judaism and Christianity? I, I just had a website yesterday with a great Jewish scholar at Arizona State University, and she inhabits the word world of virtue ethics and says community is crucial. She grew up in a kibbutz, you see. So as you cultivate caring, compassion, kindness, kinship, name the virtues, we know them. Um, this is what she's advocating from uh, a Jewish point of view as well. Um, someone also said, can you say something more about World War I and Deschardins, Teilhard Deschardins. We have a wonderful website for him, Pierre Teilhard Deschardins, a Jesuit and a scientist who spent a good part of his career in China. He discovered one of the important fossils, Peking man. Um, and he was banished though from Europe. He was born in France because he was so far ahead of his time. But he was sent as a chaplain to be a stretcher bearer in World War I um, and was in the trenches, which is supposed to be some of the most dreadful uh, warfare ever. And he had this prayerful vision that even in this moment of destruction, something was emerging of hope and possibility toward a future. And his whole idea, he's a great influence on this journey of the universe for myself and Brian and John who, who made this film, um, because he was trying to activate human energy. Be between the two wars, you had existentialism, you had despair, you had a sense of hopelessness. And he said, we must activate human energy. And that's why he developed this sense of evolution as a context for the human. Thomas Berry said, let's tell it as a story that's even more accessible. So that's, uh, I should stop there. There's a few more questions, but Mark, you might want to pop in 
No, I'm. I'm. Please keep going. These questions are great, and you're. We're, we can go right down them. I, I. These are. It's so important that we answer these questions, and we're so. And we're so glad they're engaged. To so go ahead. Okay, so um, Alexander is asking about commenting on cultural diversity supporting protection of biodiversity and vice versa. That is so important. And we know actually that some of the hotspots for biodiversity around the planet are where indigenous peoples live. And that's why this protection, especially in rainforest, but elsewhere are so critical. So cultural diversity and biodiversity are very interlinked. You know, I thank you for that question. And I must mention that we are hoping to launch, it might take until the summer in June, but we've been working steadily for six months on five massive open online classes that will be free for audit on the world's religions and their environmental positions, their ethics and their justice to evoke that moral force. So this sense that we're putting into that, we have one on, it's an introduction, one on indigenous traditions, Western religions, South Asian religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, East Asian religions, the Confucianism and Taoism. But in the indigenous course, we have found an extraordinary number of videos, which we're gonna share with you, they're amazing, of resilience and restoration that indigenous peoples are doing all up and down our West Coast, of fisheries, of rivers, of forests, and so on. It's quite extraordinary. So you'll get word of that, um, and we'll be happy to have you um, as part of it. Um, our, my friend Irene Woodward from Green Faith is ask, asking, if you had Biden's ear, what would you nudge this administration to do? And someone else asked something similar. Um, you know, I think he's already started, hasn't he, in his extraordinary um, inaugural speech in that day, and Amanda Gorham with her marvelous speech, which was very much in the spirit that we're talking about tonight. So I would say, <laughs> You've got so far the best climate people around. One of our graduates from our school is, is involved and many people that we know are involved in this environmental <laughs> green movement forward and in the areas of compassion, of helping with this terrible pandemic, of helping with the health issues. You know, my sister um, is also, I think, on this call <laughs> and she works for many years with developmentally delayed young adults. These are the areas of compassion that we need to foreground. And I think this administration with a concern for education for every level can move forward. So education, environment, health, justice, fairness, articulating this over and over again it makes me cry because I'm so hopeful. Oh, that's so amazing. Oh my gosh, same here. You 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 make me cry thinking that way. Um wow. Let's let's see. Are are there any do we have any other questions? Yeah, there's a question about the tipping point. Do do yeah. you believe that and I feel like we have an opportunity tipping point in a way. Mm -hmm. Um where do you feel? Yeah, I mean it, it was interesting. The question is, did, the last four years, do we feel like we could have reached a tipping point? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that is such a good question. And I think you brought it up in ways too, Mark. Um, I think that's in the back of every person's mind who's caring and thinking about their future, not just their future, their family's future, their cousin's future, um, those they love's future. We've got to think intergenerationally. We've got to think internationally. There's no future, as I say, without a shared future. And that is the opportunity for this crushing moment of <laughs> terrible <laughs> law, you know, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. We could go on and on. These were really destructive of our place in the world. I have been to so many international conferences where people say, why can't Americans join the international community. It's it's unbelievable. It's and now, truly unbelievable. And now and Biden. Now have, yeah, now we, but this was even before Biden. Right. You know, we have not always done what we need to do. And 
Um, here's another very hopeful thing, though, in, in response to this. Have we gone beyond the tipping point? You know, <clears throat> this is the Stockholm Resilience Institute. Johan Rockström came up with this idea of planetary boundaries. And another great scientist in Germany at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research came up with tipping points. Mm -hmm. Now, both of these are people I know, and both of them are people with religious sensibilities. And they would say, we have not yet gone past the tipping points. This is why we have this possibility for not overshooting planetary boundaries. But we must capture this moment. That is what scientists are saying. And, you know, the human will to change. When we had, if we can just give a few examples, abolition. It took Quakers in England at least three decades to argue that the slave trade was morally wrong. And just because it was economically profitable, it was still morally wrong. That took a long, long time. Civil rights has taken a long, long time. It's still evolving. Black Lives Matter is an example of it. These things take time, but they have to be persistent. We've been at this religion and ecology for 25 years, and now the interest is exploding. And I'll give you one final, because scientists Good. realize there's a moral force. Let me give you one final example. And that is the Treaty for Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons just passed last week at the UN to say, these are weapons of mass destruction and we can no longer afford them. That started 30 years ago. There are now 50 countries who have signed on and that was all the work of grassroots people, scientists um, and religious people saying this is morally problematic. My dear friend, Sister Megan Rice and the Catholic workers worked hard on that um, as well. So these are hopeful signs. And you know, like you're saying, these things take time. 40 years ago was the first female vice presidential candidate. Yes. And we now have a female vice president. I mean, this is, you're right, it takes time, but we are we are always working hard on this challenge of, of, of working on ourselves globally and as a nation. Yes. And I agree, I have so much hope for the future. Thank you for sharing that passion. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at if there's, there's, there was one more question, because I think it's a good place for us to, um, to sort of you, he asked if you could talk a little bit more about the new story, this okay. new story for the future. Right, and I just realized it's my cousin John Mahol who asked that question of tipping points. Oh, good. <laughs> so I thank you for that, and for Donna, his wife. Um, so the new story, um, as I was saying at the beginning, children love stories. We all love stories. The first thing when we meet each other, we kind of tell our stories, what we do or our family or whatever. Stories do light us up. And this sense that we need something that brings together science and religion, evolution and ethics, facts and values. You see, we've had this split between science as having all the facts and religion having values and spirituality, and they've been very separate. I can tell you my whole life in secular academia, Columbia, Harvard, Berkeley, Yale, it is a real struggle to talk about spirituality and ethics within that framework. And here's the point. Again, I'm a huge proponent of science. We need it. <laughs> the pandemic has shown us how much we need it. Um, but in particular, if we take a reductionist point of view, which says there's no meaning in evolution, there's just the fa empirical facts that we can discover through science, telescopes or microscopes, we put out those facts, but we leave the meaning apart because science, scientists don't want to comment on meaning. But that is what has been inherited in our educational systems throughout. So you tell, it, you tell evolution as a me mechanistic and reductionist process, but there's no purpose to it. Yes. What do we say to our students? Have a nice day. You know, how do you derive your sense of meaning and purpose? And so this new story is trying to fuse the best of our evolutionary understandings 
from geology, biology, and so on, with a sense of wonder and awe and purpose. These are religious sensibilities. Um, and scientists, many of them get that, but this is a new fusion where we're invited into a new weave of beauty, purpose, awe, and meaning. That's what we're all seeking. Wow, that is so beautifully put. And I, I will tell you, I'm grateful you brought up Quakers. I'm a fourth generation Quaker. Oh, nice. And my grandfather was in the trenches in World War I as well, but he wouldn't carry a gun. He was on the, the, the lines carrying the the um uh, the re the Red Cross trains. Wow. Um, but what really what I, I I what really blows my mind is every time I'm out in nature. That's how I've gotten through the pandemic is connecting with Mother Nature, is being out there thanking the universe every day, yes. thanking Mother Nature, thanking the Giver of all life, the sun. You yeah. know these. If we t if we're grateful for the beauty and the wonder we have around us and the people and the diversity of people and culture and belief, yes. we can, like you're saying, it's this holistic vision of the future. And the, this new story you just talked about, I have chills right now. Think, I mean, this is, and I hope all of us can, can take this exciting, hopeful future that you're talking about, this new story, and we can implement it in our daily lives and on a global level. And, and, and I, I actually am coming away from this very hopeful. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you, Mary Evelyn. And I am so excited to work with you in the future. Um, because, you know, we, like you said, Grace Farms, nature, arts, justice, community, faith, we, we're not afraid to talk about these larger questions. And together, along with the faith community and the international community and the environmental community, I feel like we have a beautiful future ahead of us. I just want to say thank you. We are going to, I believe we are putting in your MOOC link Good. so that everybody can access this incredible, your incredible message. Everybody, please watch the film. You know, you're, it'll blow your mind and then watch it again because I watched it four times and every time I just kept coming away with much more. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mary Evelyn, for your work with, with ecology and religion at Yale. We are so, and, and thank you for inspiring the next generation. You are right. We are all a, a generation. There was always a generation before us, but it's our job to pass on this knowledge and to, and to make the, the world a better place together. So I'm so grateful. Well, thank you, Mark. I just, I cherish your enthusiasm because that's what's going to get us through. And if I could just say, you know, look at the Journey of the Universe website, as well as these open online classes. And certainly there's a forum on religion and ecology website, and soon there will be courses. But I want to say, you know, education is at the heart of this. And I know how many of you are committed to education, not just because of your children, but just because we, we all know that's part of the future. And we've been working with secondary schools for a long, long time with teachers on this, how to get it taught, um, largely in the independent schools, but and also for even um, the grammar schools, there's a beautiful uh, trilogy by Jennifer Morgan for children on this, this story. So if you look up Jennifer Morgan, she's got three wonderful books for children on it. Um, on the Day You Were Born is a great baby book <laughs> for this idea for young, young children too. So we thank you and we so look forward, Mark, as you've said, to continuing this journey together um, and many blessings to you, your family, your staff, wonderful woman staff doing all yes. this hard work. And thank, thank you, you Brian and Reagan and Sarah and, and all of your team agreed. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, let's take seize the day on this hopeful future. Thank you, Mary Evelyn. You've inspired us all. And I can't wait to continue the conversation. The same, Mark. Thank you. Take Have a care. great Thank you.